Checkout Tracking by the NPD Group brings you a receipt collecting system that gathers data anonymously through technology we created, providing your businesses with answers. This is a great talk, Thinking Mobile Last. I mean, we, we've heard a lot today about success and how you get there. But mobile now is totally different to the way it was five years ago. There are so many games, there's so much competition. And, and the wisdom about just launching on mobile, I think, has changed. We've got Derek Morton from Flowplay here, who wants to suggest another way of doing business where perhaps you want to explore other options first. So if you'd like to put your hands together and uh, welcome Derek on the stage. Hello, am I working? Great, awesome. Hi, I'm Derek Morton. I'm the CEO of Flowplay. Flowplay makes two main games. One is Our World. It's a virtual world for teenage girls. And the other is Vegas World. It's a virtual world for middle-aged girls, uh, basically a, a MMO casino. Uh, I've been in business about eight years, but I've been in the game business for over 20 years. I uh, founded Flowplay with my partner, Doug, um, eight years ago. So. Let's get started. So there's a lot of noise out there about mobile. Everybody says it's a huge market. It's growing fast. The desktop is dying and the barrier to entry is low into mobile. And so some of that is true and some of that isn't true. Mobile's big, but the revenue is really concentrated among some of the top players. If you're not in it's one of the top selling games, you're not going to make much money on your game. Um, and most of the money that is in the product or, or being, being earned is being respent to continue to churn through and, and acquire customers. Uh, one stat I saw recently was that if you're not in the top 200, then you're gonna make less than two million a year, and two million a year sounds like a lot of money, but remember that's revenue, not profit, so most people are reinvesting probably two thirds of that money back into, uh, into their, keeping their game uh, with customers. The vast majority of games make no money at all. Uh, there's a stat out there that Supercell, Rovio, and King make over half of all the mobile game revenue in the United States. So those three companies together represent, it's barely over half, so it's about 50.2% of all revenue in the U.S. in mobile games, which is incredible. This is concentrated among these three people, and there's probably a couple more that you could name that are just below those guys, which take the total revenue that uh, a few people are earning, probably up to 60-65%. Uh, you'll also see here um, some estimates about the size of the U.S. revenue, U.S. mobile game revenue. Uh, what's not included here, you'll, these look a little low to you probably because there's no advertising included here. This is in-app purchase, so I believe the real numbers are probably, they could, they could be as high as 50% larger because they have not, and these estimates included advertising. But what you'll notice is that uh, the growth is that red line. Uh, the year-over-year -year growth is, is starting to slow. So by 2016, the year-over-year -year growth is expected to only be about 9%, uh, going from 3.04 uh, million to 3.3 million. Uh, so a little bit of slowing growth there, and there are a lot of, lot of more new people coming into the space. So less and less room. Uh, we talked a little bit about how the platform is super flooded. 14,842 games were submitted just in May, in one month. So it's around, it's, in any given month, it's around 450 to 500 games per day, new games being submitted to the App Store. Like, how could you possibly be discovered in all that noise? And, and today in, in iTunes, there are almost 400,000 games that are considered active games that are available in the iTunes Store. So that's just a graph of what it's looked like over time, if you look at the number of, of submissions into iTunes. I don't really know what that little bump is. I'm, I'm very curious about it though, so I'm gonna do a little research and find out what that is. I, 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 it, it's gotta be something interesting that happened that where, where the iTunes store suddenly said, okay, we're not, we're not taking any more uh, Supercell ripoffs anymore for a day. Uh, are the barriers to entry really low? Well, they're, they're getting higher and higher. Budgets for mobile games are getting higher all the time. Uh, there's more and more handsets coming out, so every time a new Android device comes out, it's not too bad on the, uh, on the Apple side, but certainly on the Android side, uh, Android complexity is getting greater and greater. Uh, every time a new one comes out, there's something cool going on on the side or some new format 
causes headaches for developers. It's about two times as hard to make a, uh, two to three times as hard to make a mobile game as it is to make a web game, mostly because you're having to consider handsets, you're having to consider platform, uh, and then you're having to work with app stores, especially when it comes to iTunes, for, to submit, make sure you get, meet all their requirements, and you know, once in a while you get kicked back. Uh, acquisition cost, you can, you can walk around the show floor here and see what the percentage of companies that are actually in the business of customer acquisition versus actually in the business of making games. People that are in the acquisition business far, far, far outnumber the people that are actually making the products. Uh, and that's a little scary. So it's mostly people that, that sell the picks and shovels uh, like the old gold mining days, not people that are actually finding gold with those picks and shovels. Uh, you'll, there's a lot of threats underway too right now in terms of uh, Android, I mean uh, Google Play and iTunes threatening to be, have more editorial control, so less and less uh, opportunity for you to sort of, not, gaming the system is kind of a bad way to put it, but there, there are things you can do to sort of like push your downloads, download, daily downloads up and get a bit higher rankings. Uh, so the, the, the stores are, are looking at that and figuring out ways to actually uh, intercede and, st and stop some of that. Probably could, could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. Here's a really, really scary graph. Um, the red lines in each territory are the average revenue per download of a game in that territory. And the green line is the average cost to acquire a customer to get that download. So you'll see that in the US, it costs around a, an average of $2.17 to get a, a, your game downloaded but the average uh, revenue per download is only $2.52. And that's a razor thin margin. That's only about, what, 35 cents for every game. That's a, and on a percentage basis, it's less than 10% uh, margin. And you've got a lot of, you know, <laughs> a lot to spend that money on. Certainly Japan looks really great. The uh, Japanese market looks much more lucrative, uh, but for, for a Western company, damn near impossible to get in there. Same thing with South Korea. Uh, I'm not sure why Australia looks so great, but I think that's worth investigating. Australia looks like it's got a, a great ratio from, from revenue to, um, uh, to cost of acquisition. Just another way to look at it, uh, Fixu has this thing that they call the loyal user index that they track over time. Loyal user, they define as someone who's played your game, who's launched it three times. So the cost to acquire that player, they're estimating at about $2.47. If you compare that to last year, it's about a 50% increase year over year to acquire that loyal user. Another cool graph I found is the, the disparity between what the top games make on a, a this is, uh, this is uh, ARPU, average revenue per user. Oh, this is, yeah, this is normal ARPU, not ARPU. Uh, <laughs> Puzzles and Dragons just making amazing money, but even a, a successful game or quasi successful game like Zynga Poker is far, 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 far below that in terms of the, the average revenue per player. So you can see that, that once you get out of the, the top echelon of the highest performing games, the, the revenue per player begins to drop dramatically. And I just came up with a graph just to sh kind of show you. Uh, this is a, a comparison of conversion rate to pay, which is the numbers along the bottom of the screen, to the ARPUPU, which is the average revenue per paying player on the left, and where your break-even point is based upon how many players you can convince to pay for your game versus uh, the, the free players. So the, uh, the fixed number is about $2.50 per install. So that means, and, they, and we know from Swerve that the average conversion rate to pay is 1.5%. So it means that the average ARPUPU is about $165 per, R, per paying player per game, which is, uh, that's not a small number uh, to, get a, to actually make a, a game which is capable of letting somebody spend $1,000, which is probably necessary to get that 165. It's not easy to do. Uh, this, la this other piece about the desktops going away, the sky is falling. Well, the desktop is not going away. This is uh, Statista. There are estimates of how many desktops are going to ship. This is desktops and laptops. They're going to ship through 2019. And you can see that while there have been uh, decreases over the past couple of years, they're expecting the shipments of desktops and laptops to be fairly flat for the next few years. This is another way to look at it. Uh, New Zoo, really great uh, statistics and, and uh, data company. Uh, they are taking a look at how much revenue was made in 2014, what we're estimating for 2015, and what they're estimating for 2018. The green at the bottom is, uh, is PC games. 
So PC games, and this is including um, Moda and stuff like that, though, uh, are making about 31.5 billion, expected to go about 41.2 billion by 2018. So there's still growth. There's, in fact, what is there? There's, they're saying, uh, this is, there's something like 5% growth over the, next, uh, over the next four years still left in the desktop. So the desktop is not dead. There's still plenty of money to be made. And even uh, you'll see this very far right, almost $7 billion in casual web game revenue in 2018 expected. Um, another data point is we're in the social casino business. Uh, desktop still makes more money than mobile in the social casino business. That top blue line is the monthly revenue generated by mobile by social casinos, and the red on desktop, and the red line is the social casino revenue uh, generated on mobile. Uh, months and months ago, people were saying, "Oh, well, mobile's about to kill the desktop. The desktop's going to get a crossover for the first time ever," and that didn't happen. Uh, and all of a sudden, the desktop is still reigning supreme, still making over half the revenue in the social casino space. The ecosystem is really, really broken. And one of the ways you can tell that it's broken is that a healthy, a healthy ecosystem in gaming supports a publisher, developer, distributor model. That's been, that's been something that's been going on since I've been in games for, for 20 years. But more and more, what you see is the publishing model does not work. The, the, the number of publishers work, actively working in mobile are decreasing all the time. You've seen Gree having issues. Gree was probably one of the preeminent publishers in the mobile game business. Uh, but because of the razor-thin margins, it doesn't support that model because there's not enough pie to split between a publisher, a developer, and a distributor. Really pisses me off the way the whole thing all came about. Um, there was really, it could have gone a different way. You know, the iTunes store, the intermediaries have been, been established to sort of like stand in the way between you and your games and be the, the one point of contact for you to get your contact. Shouldn't have happened that way. Uh, I bring up the point, that do, you, do you get all your software from Dell when you buy a Dell computer? No, you don't. Do you get all your software from Microsoft when you have a Microsoft operating system? No, you don't. But when you have an iOS device or an Android device, you're pretty limited on the number of places you can get software for that, for that device. It uh, didn't have to be that way. These, there's no reason why these, these couldn't have been totally open systems where everything happened in a browser and we could freely promote our, our products uh, through search tools and through, through the web. But no, it's not the way it happened. The way it happened was the, the two powers of B decided they would be the intermediaries and control everything, which makes it really hard. But we, we're all, we, we all love making games, and mobile is just a fact. You know, there's tons and tons of customers out there that want to play games on mobile, so you should just make the best of it. You know, and part of that is determining, from a strategic point of view, is mobile going to be your primary business, your secondary, secondary business, or a tertiary business for you? What makes sense for the way, for the kind of games you want to make and the kind of company you, you have? Uh, primary, obviously, is like you're making games from, for, uh, for mobile. Uh, secondary is sort of like what we do. We have... Um, a smaller version of our virtual world, which runs on a phone. It's not the full game, it's a, it's a portion of the game, just to give people something to do when they're not on their phone. And we even have another tertiary product for mobile, which is just a chat app, so that people that are not in the virtual world can chat on their phone with people that are in the virtual world and have their avatar appear there and stuff. And, and one of the things I'm recommending as part of this talk is that you consider going to PC first, at least if it's a place, to just test your game, uh, know what the statistics are, learn about how consumers respond to it before you take it, the big step of taking it to mobile, which is, which is super expensive. Uh, there's obviously a tablet-only strategy. In fact, if you have a tablet-only strategy, you're able to make a pretty high-quality game. Uh, Supercell did this when they first launched, and for, for, I think for their first year or so, their games were only available on tablet, and because of that, they had a really high-quality bar. Uh, eventually, they launched them on, on phones, but that was when they had a, a huge consumer base to work with, and their marketing costs weren't as high because of that. Uh, I mentioned this, this whole piece about the support product. This is what we do. Uh, one of our products is just a chat app. Uh, it gives our, our players a way to, to, uh, to go when they're on the go. One statistic I, th I thought was really interesting is that, uh, particularly for the social casino space that we're in, 40% of the people that play social casino play both the PC version and the, the, um, the mobile version, which is pretty cool, especially considering that 46% of those players 
started on the PC side and then went to mobile, which means if you have a, a PC product and a mobile product, that your cost, cost of customer acquisition can be much lower because you're finding customers on the PC first and then telling them about your mobile product. PC first, the benefits are there's no risk uh, when you use distribution channels. Uh, we'll talk about some distribution channels in a minute, but there are people out there that will distribute your mobile game for free, actually help promote it for you uh, with no upfront costs, just a revenue share. Uh, acquisition costs are much, much cheaper. Uh, you can test your game much more easily than you can make mistakes and test your game on mobile. Uh, you can iterate and optimize on, on just a single target versus multiple handsets. There's more ways to pay on PC, uh, lots of different options in terms of PayPal, um, credit cards, all kinds of different ways. We, we even have a, a payment method where you take your change to the, to the Coinstar box in a grocery store and pay for us. Uh, I mentioned distribution channels, so there's still exist places where you can take your web game and have and make money off of it. Yahoo's one, AOL. Uh, we work with all these guys, uh, except for Steam. Steam's probably a, a more mid-core and we're a more casual game product. But there's still places out there where you can take your web game, take the product that you're considering taking to mobile, and test it out first to see what, what your, you know, how consumers respond, what your, your return rates are, what your ARPU is, before you do prepare that game to go into mobile and start actually spending real money to acquire customers. Cost per acquisition is only about a dollar or so uh, if you're doing SEM on, uh, on the PC side. Facebook campaigns can be a little bit more expensive, but it's really easy to target your customers and find exactly the customers you want on Facebook. It can run from $1.25 to $2.50. Um, and you're not looking for, in some cases, if you're, if you're doing a, a PC first strategy, you really only need a few thousand players. You're not interested, if you're, if you're not interested in really making a business of the, uh, of the PC business, but you really want to test and see what happens to your game before taking it to mobile, a few thousand customers will tell you a lot about your game in terms of return rates, uh, conversion to pay, and ARPU. Um, some of the reason why people don't want to go to a PC first um, strategy is because of development. So it's, it's, there's a, a lot of tools um, that, don't allow, that don't do a great job of, of letting you distribute on the web. Uh, obviously, Unity has a web strategy, but, but it's not great. Uh, they're kind of in transition between the, the plugin and OpenGL, and I haven't seen any success stories on the, for casual games written in Unity on the, on the website. Uh, Adobe Air works, but Adobe Air has really high CPU and memory uh, requirements. Uh, and games need a lot, a lot of tuning to actually run well on a, on a mobile device. So we're huge, hands, uh, huge fans of this thing called Hacks OpenFL. Hacks allows you to code once, but compile natively for Android, for iOS, for, for, for you can actually uh, build a Swift or build HTML5 or a executable for Windows and Mac. Uh, really great, and it's particularly because it's free. It doesn't cost any money. It's open source, so there's a whole community of people out there that are contributing to it. So you can create your own components, your own pieces to, to if you want have features that aren't available in the toolkit, you can create the, those features and con contribute those to the community. All right, now if you do try to follow a, a, a PC first strategy, one of the benefits is you get better day one reviews, and these are really important. Nothing is worse than getting your mobile game already, launching it, and on the first day you begin to see negative feedback. So having a PC first strategy allows you to at least test some of this stuff out first before you actually go to mobile and get these, these bad day one reviews. Uh, you know, as you've got your, your, uh, your game dialed in and you have a better handle, like I mentioned before, of, of your ARPU and your customer acquisition cost. Now get off my lawn, you mobile first people. <laughs> All right, any questions? Yeah, I, any questions out there? I've definitely got one or two if uh, no one else has one. Yeah, so um, you mentioned a little bit about the, uh, the, the move from the app stores to this kind of well, I don't know if you really call it a move at this stage, but there certainly seems to be lip service being paid to a curated front for the App Store. I mean, how much faith do you put in that in terms of solving some of the issues that you were talking about earlier? Almost none. Uh, I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a great system now where you can pay for placement and pay for, for rankings, uh, but, but it's even worse of a black box if you, if you have no 
plan or no way, way to get your, your game into the top 100 if you, if you want to. Uh, you, you can form relationships, you can be a, a trusted vendor, uh, but that's not easy to do for, for small companies. The, big, the companies that are going to have the advantage are the really large players because they have direct relationships with the stores, can get, launch a new game and get prominent placement uh, and be, uh, you know, overtake any kind of the small players that want to get their game launched. And uh, you were talking about how <clears throat> it could, I, I quite agree that, that, that a lot of the problem is these kind of like these two storefronts that are operated by the same people you buy, all of that stuff, right? And you said it could have been different. I mean, what, what could change? What needs to change in your opinion to, to make that different? Because mobile still is this potentially incredible platform that could support so many developers. And at the moment, as you pointed out, like all of the revenue is going to one place. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're obviously, Things going on out there that aren't Android and aren't iOS, but but still look like a mobile device. Um, so Samsung's out of plan for some stuff. There are a couple of people that are building independent stores. So I know Wild Tangent's got an independent store with a couple of carriers, relationships they have. Uh, Playphone, I believe, has an independent store that they've built as well. So there's a little bit of movement. These they're still tiny, tiny parts of the market, but hopefully some of these things will uh, will, will begin to to grow. I mean, what what makes more sense is that you know, um, storefronts that actually specialize in the kind of game that you like to play. Like if you're a mid-core player, why are you getting your game at the same, place where, same distributor where Candy Crush is? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. There should be specialists who really love and breathe and li live these games that are mid-core games or hardcore games or whatever that are the specialists, that are the stores that are doing a great job of editorializing and presenting these games versus a generic try and one size fits all store. Yeah, I, I quite agree. My favorite game shop when I was growing up was one where they had a very hand-selected crop of Japanese games. They had uh, only the games that the owner wanted to be in there, and that chimed perfectly with me as a buyer of games, and that's something that's totally missing off mobile at the moment. I mean, uh, one, one more chance to ask Derek some questions here. It's an interesting talk. Okay, well, if you'd like to put your hands together for Derek.